This is Larry Moore. I'd like to welcome you back to our biological wastewater treatment training series. Today, we'll be doing presentation number eight, biological nitrification, denitrification. Uh, just to refresh your memory, with the previous seven presentations were wastewater quality, introduction to biological wastewater treatment, activated sludge microbiology, introduction to activated sludge biokinetics, uh, activated sludge process modifications part one, activated sludge process modifications part two, and then the last presentation was activated sludge process control. So we've laid a lot of information on you, especially if you're not familiar with uh, uh, biological wastewater treatment. So, but again, I would encourage you to go back and review the presentations uh, more than once and, and also uh, uh, read the uh, read with material that will supplement what you know about these different topics. So today let's talk about biological nitrification. Denitrification was really important today as we um, are concerned about uh, nutrients and their impact on our surface water, especially related to uh, eutrophication, excessive aquatic plant growth in our streams and rivers and also impacts the, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, as far as references, uh, again, I use Metcalf and Eddy, uh, the fourth edition, and then uh, some of the information I, I use today is obtained from the Water Environment Federation, their activated sludge process control training manual that I've used many times in the past. This uh, slide just shows you the, the nitrogen cycle in nature, uh, nitrogen existing basically in four forms in wastewater, uh, organic nitrogen, ammonia nitrogen, nitrite nitrogen, and nitrate nitrogen. And uh, we can release nitrogen gas into wastewater under anoxic conditions, but nitrogen gas is not very soluble in water, so most of it bubbles out of solution. Uh, as I said, our, our, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, are nutrients that can promote excessive aquatic plant growth in our receiving streams, and uh, that's undesirable. Uh, but we can also uh, get some um, the algae and duckweed growth on secondary clarifiers, as you see in this picture here. So they can create uh, some issues for us in the activated sludge process itself. And uh, we, we have to spend a lot of time cleaning secondary clarifier, effluent weirs, uh, algae, and other slime growth related to the nutrients. Nitrification. Uh, nitrification is a, a bacterial oxidation process whereby uh, the nitrifying bacteria oxidize ammonia first to nitrite nitrogen, NO2 nitrogen and then it is oxidized to nitrate nitrogen, which is NO3 nitrogen. And it consumes a considerable amount of alkalinity. So when we design and operate an activated sludge plant that is nitrifying, we have to be very uh, careful about our alkalinity uh, requirements. And do we have enough alkalinity coming in in the raw wastewater to meet our needs? If we don't, we'll probably have to supplement the alkalinity by adding uh, soda ash or lime or caustic to the uh, wastewater to provide additional alkalinity uh, so that we have adequate alkalinity and buffer our pH in the range where the process is uh, very efficient. Now this illustration I put together several years ago uh, just shows you basically what happens to the different four different forms of nitrogen in the activated sludge wastewater treatment process. In the raw wastewater, again, nitrogen comes in in two forms, organic nitrogen and ammonia nitrogen. It's very unusual if we have nitrite or nitrate in the raw wastewater because nitrite and nitrate are the oxidized forms of nitrogen. And in raw sewage, because of the septic conditions or anaerobic conditions that are present, we have a, an anaerobic reducing environment. And so uh, we don't expect to find much nitrite and nitrate. So typically in medium strength municipal wastewater, I usually figure we've got about 35 to 40 milligrams per liter of TKN, total Keldahl nitrogen coming in in the raw wastewater. About 50 to 60% of the TKN will be ammonia nitrogen. 
and about 40 to 50 percent of the TKN will be organic nitrogen. Well, during the, the activated sludge process, our heterotrophic bacteria are breaking down organic matter. And when they break down that organic matter, oxidize it to CO2 and water, et cetera, um, they're going to release ammonia. Some of that organic matter will actually be converted into ammonia uh, during the bacterial decomposition process. We can call that hydrolysis of organic nitrogen to ammonia. Uh, maybe as much as 50% or so of the organic nitrogen that comes in in the raw wastewater will actually be converted to ammonia uh, through this process during, uh, again, the removal of carbonaceous BOD by the heterotrophic bacteria. Now, some of the ammonia nitrogen will be removed by a process that we call assimilation. We're growing bacterial cell mass and the predominant uh, bacterial cell mass production are our heterotrophs. Talk more about that later. So the heterotrophic cell mass production will uh, will assimilate ammonia nitrogen as the cells are produced because, again, those cells um, theoretically are about 12% by weight nitrogen. So for every pound of uh, cell mass we generate, uh, we consume about uh, 0.12 pounds of nitrogen uh, making that cell mass. And so that's our, our net growth of uh, organic nitrogen or net growth of biomass that, again, it removes uh, nitrogen as ammonia, but it's converted into organic nitrogen. And then, of course, through the process of nitrification, we can oxidize ammonia by the nitrifying bacteria, which are different. Again, the, the bacteria that convert organic nitrogen to ammonia, they're breaking down the organic matter. Those are our facultative heterotrophs, the dominant type of bacteria. But we also have nitrifying bacteria bacteria that are autotrophs, they use inorganic carbon as their carbon source, and the ammonia will be oxidized to nitrite by the nitrite, by the ammonia oxidizing bacteria, and then the nitrite nitrogen will be oxidized to nitrate nitrogen by the nitrite oxidizing bacteria. And then if we include an anoxic reactor and we denitrify, we can convert nitrite and nitrate to nitrogen gas, and that's how we get nitrogen removal. Again, the conversion of ammonia to nitrite to nitrate is simply nitrogen conversion. We're just simply converting it from one form to another. That is not nitrogen removal, it's nitrogen conversion. Well, let's look at the, the growth dynamics of the uh, nitrifiers as compared to the growth dynamics of the, the carbonaceous BOD removing bacteria or the facultative heterotrophs. Well, the municipal wastewater carbonaceous BOD will be about 200 milligram per liter, ballpark estimate. And the total catalyst nitrogen will be about 35 or 40 milligram per liter. So we got about five or six times as much BOD as we do uh, TKN coming in in the raw wastewater. And the, the yield of the heterotrophs, the biomass produced per unit BOD consumed is much higher for these facultative heterotrophs. We'll produce about 0.6 pounds of biomass per pound of CBOD removed. And on the uh, autotrophic bacteria, we'll generally produce about 0.15 pounds of uh, nitrifier biomass per pound of ammonia nitrogen oxidized to nitrate nitrogen. So in a activated sludge system, typically, 96% to 100% of our bacteria will be the facultative heterotrophs, our CBOD removing bacteria. About 0% to 4% of the bacterial cell mass will be the nitrifying bacteria. So the process is dominated by the heterotrophic bacteria. But even if we only have two or three or 4% of the uh, population of bacteria or the nitrifying bacteria, we can do an excellent job of uh, oxidizing the ammonia to nitrate. The first step again, conversion of ammonia to nitrite, uh, we used to would say that was done by the bacterial species called nitrosomonas, but now we use the term ammonia oxidizing bacteria because we know that there are other species of nitrifiers that will convert ammonia to nitrite other than nitrosomonas. 
And then when we convert nitrite to nitrate, we used to say that was done by the nitrobacter. But now again, we know there are other species of nitrifiers that do that. So we say ammonia is oxidized to nitrite by the ammonia oxidizing bacteria. And the nitrite is oxidized to nitrate by the nitrite oxidizing bacteria. So again, assimilation, uh, cell mass, we use the formula C5H7O2N to represent biomass production, okay? So what we see if we do the atomic weight analysis here, uh, nitrogen is about 12.3% by weight of the cell mass that's produced. So when we produce uh, these facultative heterotrophs, which is the bulk, bulk of our bacterial production again, we're going to consume some of the ammonia nitrogen as we make up that cell mass. Uh, so any net growth of biomass is produced and wasted from the system, that's gonna allow us to achieve some nitrogen removal, but it's a fairly small percent removal of the nitrogen by assimilation. And the amount of nitrogen removed by assimilation depends on the CBOD content of the raw wastewater. If we got a, a CBOD of 200 milligrams per liter, uh, medium shrink sewage, then we may only get uh, 15, 10 to 15% removal of, uh, of nitrogen by assimilation. If we have 600 milligram per liter CBOD coming in, we may get 30 to 35% removal of uh, nitrogen by assimilation. So the more BOD coming in, carbonaceous BOD, the more nitrogen will be uh, consumed because we're going to grow more biomass. And the system operating conditions are very important. Here we're primarily referring to sludge age. At a short sludge age, again, most of the incoming organic matter is channeled into the synthesis reaction and we produce more biomass. So at a low sludge age, we would remove more nitrogen by assimilation. If we're operating at a 30 to 40 day sludge age, a long sludge age, uh, then we're gonna remove much less nitrogen by assimilation because now we're operating in the endogenous growth range and our biomass production is uh, uh, much lower. And so we'll remove less nitrogen by assimilation. But generally, the nitrogen removed by assimilation will be 0.08 to 0.12 times the biomass production. The 0.12 number would correspond to a sludge age of about three days. The 0.08 number would correspond to a sludge age of about 30 to uh, 40 days. So. Uh, nitrogen removed by assimilation is about 2% to 5% of the raw wastewater BOD. So if the raw wastewater BOD is 200 milligram per liter, then we'll remove about 4 milligram per liter to 10 milligram per liter of nitrogen from the wastewater by assimilation. Uh, and then if we talk about in terms of nitrogen removal, again, in treating medium strength municipal wastewater, we'll remove about 8% to 20% of the nitrogen by assimilation into cell mass production that is wasted from the system. So, but if the BOD is much higher, then our nitrogen removal will also be uh, uh, higher. And another thing we have to consider when we look at overall nitrogen removal through an activated sludge process, we can get return streams from sludge processing that will return quite a bit of nitrogen back to us. For instance, if we have anaerobic digestion and we're returning anaerobic digester supernatant back to the head of the plant, that anaerobic digester supernatant may have 200 milligrams per liter of ammonia nitrogen in it. So that's a return stream that will bring nitrogen back to us and that may, again, reduce our overall nitrogen removal. Okay, this, this is the biochemical or these are the biochemical reactions that represent nitrification. And in both equations, what I've shown you here, again, is a combination of the synthesis and energy reaction for the nitrifying bacteria. So what is the synthesis reaction? Again, nitrifying bacteria, autotrophs, they use inorganic carbon, either CO2 or bicarbonate. Here we have it represented as bicarbonate ion. They're going to consume inorganic carbon to make cell mass. And uh, the first reaction, again, the ammonia is being converted to nitrite nitrogen by the ammonia oxidizing bacteria. 
and the nitrite is being converted to nitrate nitrogen in the second step by the nitrite oxidizing bacteria. But again, the uh, use of the inorganic nitrogen and nutrients to form cell mass is the synthesis component of the reaction. And then the nitrifying bacteria generate energy by oxidizing, the ALBs generate energy by oxidizing ammonia to nitrite. And the NOBs, the nitrite oxidizing bacteria, generate energy by oxidizing the nitrite to nitrate. That's how they generate energy to keep themselves alive, okay? So the overall reaction, those of you who like it to get it down to the nitty gritty, if we combine the two reactions and, and really calculate it uh, down to the nth degree, then the equation looks something like this. Ammonia or ammonium ion plus uh, oxygen plus bicarbonate goes to nitrate cell mass. Uh, and we're generating carbonic acid, which is that's what consumes the alkalinity and we also generate a little bit of water. And again, the AOBs are the ammonia oxidizing bacteria, the NOBs are the nitrite oxidizing bacteria. Theoretically, it requires 4.57 grams of oxygen to oxidize a gram of ammonia nitrogen to nitrate nitrogen. Well, then you say, well, Larry, why have you got a number of 4.33? Well, the reason for that is about 5% of the ammonia nitrogen will be assimilated into bacterial cell mass production. So we're going to, through the synthesis reaction, grow a little bit of, of nitrifier cell mass. Again, it's very small compared to the heterotrophic cell mass production. So when we take that 5% out, then the, the net amount of oxygen we need for nitrification is 4.33 grams of oxygen per gram of ammonia nitrogen converted to nitrate nitrogen. The alkalinity destroyed will be 7.14 uh, pounds of alkalinity per pound of ammonia nitrogen oxidized to a pound of nitrate nitrogen. The new cells formed again will be about 0.15 pounds of nitrifier cell mass per pound of ammonia nitrogen oxidized to a pound of nitrate nitrogen. And about 80% of this cell mass production is the ammonia oxidizing bacteria. And about 20% of the bio, nitrifier biomass production will be the nitrite oxidizing bacteria. And then as we said, we'll consume uh, inorganic nitrogen uh, as we uh, produce uh, nitrifier cell mass. We consume about 0.08 pounds of inorganic carbon for every pound of ammonia nitrogen converted to nitrate nitrogen. So these are important calculations that we make in design. And then we can also look at them as we uh, calculate how our nitrification process is operating when we're operating the treatment plant. So if we nitrify compared to an activated sludge facility that may be operating at about a three day sludge age that doesn't nitrify, and let's say we're operating at maybe a 20 to 30 day sludge age, then nitrification coupled with the CBOD removal will cause us to use about 25% to 45% more oxygen to achieve CBOD removal, carbonaceous BOD removal, and NBOD removal, nitrogenous BOD removal. So when we convert ammonia to nitrate, that does remove nitrogenous BOD. It does not remove nitrogen. It just simply converts ammonia to nitrite and then to nitrate. So when we nitrify, we're going to substantially increase our oxygen requirements. Now, let me talk about how we consider that. In the city of Memphis, we have two very large treatment plants. Uh, one plant's designed for 135 million gallons a day average daily flow. The other plant's designed for an average daily flow of 90 million gallons a day. Each of those plants and their NPDES permit has a very generous limit for ammonia nitrogen. It's not very stringent at all. And because of that, we operate those two treatment plants at about a three day sludge age. So we're trying to prevent nitrification because we're trying to control our operating costs. Each of those two treatment plants in Memphis, their electric bill each month is about $400,000. 
if we were to operate, say, at a 10-day sludge age versus a three-day sludge age, and we were to substantially nitrify, then we need a lot more oxygen, about 25% to 45% more oxygen. And our power bill, our electric bill, would go from about $400,000 a month to about $500,000 a month. And that's an extra $1.2 million a year the city of Memphis tries to avoid because we have a very uh, uh, lenient uh, ammonia nitrogen limit in the effluent and we can meet it without nitrification and we're trying to save on operating costs. So this shows you again, if you look out way to the right, our ultimate carbonaceous BOD and ultimate nitrogenous BOD. Again, if this is 100% uh, carbon, ultimate carbonaceous BOD is 100% of our oxygen demand, then if we nitrify fully, then our oxygen requirements go up to about 140% of what they would be uh, if we were just removing the carbonaceous BOD, an increase of about uh, 40%. Again, we're concerned about alkalinity because uh, the optimum pH for nitrification, as we'll see in a moment, is actually about seven and a half to eight. And so we would operate in that range, but typically most nitrifying systems, as long as we're operating in a pH range of about seven to eight, then we get good nitrification because pH definitely affects the nitrification reaction. The uh, uh, TKN content of the raw wastewater will determine how much alkalinity we actually need to buffer the pH in a range uh, that's favorable for nitrification. If the TKN in the raw wastewater is about 50 milligrams per liter, then we'll need about 400 milligram per liter of alkalinity to buffer the pH in a range that gives us good nitrification and leaves a residual alkalinity of 40 or 50 milligram per liter. We want to relieve usually 40 or 50 milligram per liter more of alkalinity in the effluent so that we buffer the pH uh, in a range that keeps the pH above six so we meet our uh, pH requirements in the NPDES permit, which is 6.0 to 9.0. If the TKN in raw wastewater is 40 milligram per liter, we'll need about 330 milligram per liter of alkalinity. If the TKN in the raw wastewater is 30 milligram per liter, we'll need about 260 milligram per liter of alkalinity. And again, we get some mediation here because as that Again, as the nitrification reaction takes place, we put CO2 in solution, which forms reacts with the water to form carbonic acid that depresses the pH. But again, some of that CO2 will bubble up into the atmosphere, stripped into the atmosphere, and that, that mediates the drop in pH uh, somewhat for us. So the growth rate of the nitrifiers or the nitrification reaction rate depends on six factors, the ammonia nitrogen concentration, the DO concentration, pH, sludge age, temperature, and if we have uh, inhibition by uh, priority pollutants, heavy metals and toxic organics, they can interfere and inhibit the nitrification process. But to maintain enough nitrifiers in the system so that we do a reasonably good job of nitrification, the sludge age, the reciprocal the sludge age should be greater than the reciprocal of the net specific growth rate of the nitrifier. So, so if the specific growth rate of the nitrifiers is 0.2, then the reciprocal of, of 0.2 is 1 over 0.2 is 5. We'll need a sludge age greater than about five days in order to have enough nitrifying bacteria to get uh, nitrification started in the system. Uh, and that's at about 23 degrees C. Let's look at the impact of pH. And if we hold temperature constant at 20 degrees C, what do we see is that we get our maximum rate of nitrification at a pH range, as I said earlier, of about seven and a half to eight. The most activated sludge processes operate in the range of seven to eight. So even though it's reduced somewhat at a pH of seven, even at a pH of seven, we still can do uh, a very good job of nitrification. But again, the optimum pH is seven and a half to eight. What about temperature? The optimum temperature for nitrification is about 29 degrees C, 29 degrees Celsius. 
so if we're uh, maybe in the spring or fall when the mixed liquor temperature is about 20 degrees C, then we'll be operating at about 35 to 40% of the maximum nitrification rate that would occur in the summer if the mixed liquor temperature is 29 degrees C. If we're in the middle of January and we got a mixed liquor temperature in the range of five to 10 degrees C, our nitrification rate will only be about 15% of what it is at 29 degrees C. So the nitrifiers in the middle of winter, they are dramatically slowed by the cold temperature. And we have to keep that in, in consideration as we look at our nitrification uh, effectiveness. DO affects the nitrification rate. Uh, at a, uh, the optimum DO for nitrification may be five or six milligrams per liter. I would say that that DO would be up around 100% of our hypothetical maximum rate. But what's interesting, even at 0.1 milligram per liter of DO, our nitrification rate is about one sixth of what it is at a DO of around five or six. Of course, we don't want to operate at five or six because uh, we're going to waste energy at that DO. But uh, let's say if we're operating at a, a DO of two, then at a 0.1 milligram per liter DO, our nitrification rate is about one fifth of what it is at a DO of two milligrams per liter. So we need to keep that in mind. If we want to get substantial nitrification, in other words, greater than 75% uh, conversion of ammonia nitrogen to nitrate nitrogen. We want to operate at a, a, an SRT or MCRT or sludge age over eight days. And this graph that I put together, this is based on uh, empirical data from actual operating activated sludge plants in the United States at a temperature of 20 degrees C. So what this tells you is approximately the efficiency of nitrification depending upon SRT in days. So again, I told you the two plants in Memphis, we operate at about a three-day SRT or sludge age to minimize the efficiency of nitrification to keep our power costs down. But if we're an oxidation ditch and we're operating at about 30 days, you can see that our nitrification efficiency will be up around maybe 95, 96%, which is good. We'll produce very little ammonia nitrogen in the effluent. So again, as we get above about eight days, we're gonna remove our, oxid our, our nitrification efficiency will be over 75%. And at 40 days, it's approaching uh, 99%. So sludge age, very important impact on nitrification. Now, inhibition is very important. Uh, we can have, if we get too many, uh, too much, uh, too high concentration of heavy metals coming in, in the raw wastewater, copper, nickel, zinc, chromium, lead, cadmium, it can inhibit the, inhibit the nitrifying bacteria and reduce our nitrification efficiency. If we get uh, too much uh, organic, uh, toxic organics, uh, methyl ethyl ketone, um, uh, potassium hydrogen thiolate or uh, bis 2 ethyl hexyl thiolate or some other uh, organic compound that's toxic, they can also inhibit the nitrification reaction. And another important consideration, since a lot of industries use surfactants, if you have an industry that's using uh, alkyl phenol ethoxylates, alkyl phenol ethoxylate surfactants, and if they come in uh, at a few milligrams per liter, you can have a significant impact on your nitrifiers and inhibit the nitrification process substantially. I've seen that at a plant in Kentucky recently where the alkyl phenol ethoxylate significantly inhibited the nitrification reaction. If we have a separate stage system, and this we don't design these this way anymore, but uh, 40 years ago, we might design two-stage activated sludge. The first stage activated sludge plant would be designed to get rid of the carbonaceous BOD. The second stage activated sludge plant will be designed to nitrify. We don't do that anymore. We do it in a combined system but because we know we can get excellent nitrification and even nitrification denitrification in a combined or one activated sludge system. We don't need uh, two activated sludge uh, systems in series to nitrify. 
And, and, and 40 years ago, we might have a three-stage activated sludge system. First stage, get CBOD removal. Second stage, to nitrify. And the third stage, where the uh, reactor will be anoxic. And we might add methanol to the third stage uh, to, to denitrify in the third stage. But again, we don't do that anymore because it's so expensive to build a system like that. So we can do it in a single stage activated sludge system. But uh, if we're using a single sludge system, which is what we do now, um, we have to be more concerned about the inhibition effect of heavy metals, uh, toxic organic compounds, surfactants. And if we have inhibition, one, one thing we can do, especially if we get a substantial industrial contribution in our municipal wastewater, and we have an inhibition, inhibiting chemicals coming in, one thing we can do is add powdered activated carbon to our mixed liquor. Powdered activated carbon has an ability to absorb toxic organic compounds and powdered activated carbon also has an ability to absorb heavy metals. And so that can reduce the inhibition effect. And the best way to control it is to control these inhibiting compounds at the source through our pretreatment program so that it doesn't interfere with our nitrification uh, reaction in the activated sludge process. Proximate concentrations where nickel, chromium, copper, and zinc can begin to inhibit the uh, nitrification reaction. So we have to be concerned about that, especially uh, we do calculations uh, to determine what our local limit should be on heavy metals, uh, usually based on inhibition effects on the nitrifying bacteria. Just briefly, we'll introduce denitrification. We'll spend most of our uh, next presentation uh, on denitrification. But in denitrification, we're going to biologically convert nitrate nitrogen, nitrite nitrogen to nitrogen gas. And it's done under anoxic conditions where we try to get the DO uh, down near 0, 0.0 milligrams per liter. And denitrification is accomplished by our facultative heterotrophs. So the, the nitrifying bacteria, which are autotrophs, they convert ammonia to nitrate. But when we denitrify in the anoxic reactor, the facultative heterotrophs or our carbonaceous BOD removing bacteria, they allow us to denitrify. And denitrify, denitrification can occur in our activated sludge system when we don't want it to occur. An example of that is in the secondary clarifier. If we're doing a good job of nitrification, we go into the secondary clarifier and our sludge sits in the bottom of the secondary clarifier too long, the DO goes down near zero and there are nitrates there, then we'll get denitrification in the sludge blanket. We'll start releasing nitrogen gas bubbles and those nitrogen gas bubbles would adhere to uh, some of our sludge and actually float the sludge to the surface. We call that rising sludge and will cause us to have too much suspended solids going over our effluent weir. And that's a problem we try to avoid in our secondary clarifiers. Um, some of the advantages of denitrification, uh, by denitrification, when we nitrify and denitrify, by denitrifying, we can reduce our overall oxygen requirements about 10 to 15% generally. We can recover as much as half of the alkalinity that we've consumed in nitrification because we'll show in our next presentation, uh, when we denitrify, we'll generate as much as uh, half of the alkalinity that we consumed during the nitrification reaction. So when we denitrify, we generate alkalinity and that helps us. And then by denitrifying, we we'll also reduce the amount of total nitrogen discharged into the, uh, into the environment. And that's uh, good for the environment. So uh, to wrap it up here, again, biological activity, uh, as design engineers and operators, we control the metabolism that's going on in the reactor. We can have an aerobic reactor, an anoxic reactor, an anaerobic reactor. And by doing that, we control the source of energy. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the substrate that's consumed uh, uh, by the bacteria. And, and then for, uh, again, CBOD removal, 
uh, it's organic carbon for denitrification. That's organic carbon and uh, the source of energy uh, uh, for the nitrification reaction and the source of carbon is inorganic carbon and our means of respiration again, either aerobic metabolism, uh, aerobic respiration and noxic respiration or anaerobic respiration. And that's uh, uh, how we're going to generate energy for the bacterial cells. So thank you for participating in uh, this presentation. Again, a little introduction, mostly to nitrification and a brief introduction to denitrification. When you tune in to presentation number nine, uh, we'll talk uh, almost exclusively about denitrification. So thanks for listening. If you need to contact me or Tom Winning, you, you have our email addresses there. So feel free to do that. Thank you and have a great day.